I have the coolest job title in the world, uh, which is really cool for my kids when they go to kindergarten, mm -hmm. the show and tell, and they get to say what their dad does. The, the cool thing about working at Nimble is the, is the fact that, you know, working with uh, Amesh and his team, and, uh, and my team that I'll introduce in a second, I'm usually the dumbest guy in the room, which I really like. Um, so let me talk a little bit about kind of how we've been able to help um, Amesh and, and the rest of the team uh, do what they're do what they're doing best. Oh, geez. Thanks. Uh, let's see. You know, I, I don't use Windows. How do I go forward? Someone tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Winning. Get the man LibreOffice and his Ubuntu machine. All right. Here we go. Right. So what do I spend most of my time doing? Well, my time I spend helping my team, and what they usually are doing is either helping uh, engineering to understand some aspect of how customers use their storage, um, or else uh, trying to figure out ways to deliver insights to customers that are going to help them on a daily basis. And I'm going to walk through a couple examples of that so it kind of makes more concrete, more concrete sense. So this, is, this sounds kind of like a vacuous sentence, right? What aspects of workload interact with cash? Well, it's interesting because you know, if, if you're a disk product, it's really easy. You know what to do. You just put stuff on disk, and then you read it. And there's some clever ways to do that that were figured out a decade or more ago. Um, and you know, if you're a flash vendor, maybe you have other things that you worry about. But what we try to do is maximize price performance. So we want to get the best out of both worlds. And the way you need to do that is be really smart about what you put in the cache. And so uh, we have a product that is really smart at doing that. But, but we need to understand more about it and understand how do customers use things in the real world. When we're not cooking up a fake benchmark, we're trying to figure out what's actually important for application performance. What is that? So I'm going to show you a little of that in a second. Um, to customers, you guys have seen a little about the InfoSight portal. Um, it's a place where uh, many of our customers go very regularly um, to check on you know, capacity, uh, performance uh, limitations, or, or forecasts so they know in advance uh, that they're going to need something. Um, and what we're, what, uh, one of our, uh, so we, we have a beta coming out. Uh, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say Monday, because I, I had been saying tomorrow, but I think we're moving, and I'm, so I'm not sure, but it, at least Monday. You guys are going to get a sneak peek of it, uh, which actually allows our customers to drill down and understand what factors are causing um, latency throughout the day and help, help guide them towards resolution. So uh, move on. So some of you may have seen this. I, I did a blog post about half a year ago, and that's why it's kind of cartoony. But uh, you know, at a high level, um, this, this goes to one of the things that we do to provide insight for engineering. So uh, you know, as an example, I, I mean, there's a lot of sort of you know, hot block cache algorithms out there. People get the concept. It gets accessed a lot. You put it in cache. Um, so you know, and then there's all kinds of, you know, at a higher level, there's like, you know, LRUs and FIFOs and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, we need to keep abreast of not only, you know, what are those different approaches, but also what makes sense in the real world and what aspects of workload are going to interact with those models. So uh, here's an example. We take some, some sensor data in. Now we have, a, we have a model that understands our caching algorithm, and we have a lot of data coming in from customer arrays. So um, through that, what we worked out was, well, what's the cache, what's the cache dependence on, per, uh, on periodicity of workload? And what I mean by that is, <clears throat> let me, so what this is, is it's, it's basically the first derivative of, of cache hit with respect to cache age. And what that means is, as an example, if I, if I have a process that kicks off every day at 2 p.m., uh, and it's going to access the same set of blocks, and I want that thing to run really fast, um, if my cache age, uh, my mean cache age is, let's say it's around 23 hours, I'm going to get really bad performance on that app. And if it's 24 hours and five minutes, I'll do pretty well. So that's what this shows. And in fact, all the way out to three, three days, we can see a really strong ringing uh, that suggests that there's, you know, just in, in an overall picture, and we have this, you know, by, by application and so on, but just overall, there are multi-day dependencies and periodicities in people's workload that we need to respect. So it's not just about always going to be about hot blocks. Uh, which you are, say cache, or are you talking about the <clears throat> SSDs? You're talking about the DRAM? For or? us, it's, right now, it's SSDs. Okay. That's what we use as a cache today. Um, so 
that's an example of something we've learned about real world workloads that no, I don't think anyone else knows much about. Now this is really cool. So um, this is an exclusive alert. So we have one of our data scientists is um, working on a paper. Everybody on get this. your camera out. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. But uh, I want, I want, I want the, the team to have a chance to shout out something that's really cool and interesting that they wanted you to know um, first. <clears throat> So what, what we have here is um, estimates of the random working set size for different uh, working applications. Working set is a 50% cache hit rate or a 90% cache hit rate or? This would be, if you were to look at the uh, amount of blocks that are going to get read randomly, then this would be the size of that So set. a 60 gigabit gigabyte for the one terabyte of data for a VDI deployment would be a 100% cache hit rate. That's this what you're saying? A, this is not cache hit rate. Not cache hit rate. What are you saying? I'm saying, so there's some set of blocks, you know, people are. are the working set of blocks would be touching. in cache, you would hope, right? That, right, so you want these you're in cache. You're talking about the size of what that cache should be, <laughs> what right? What you want in cache, that's right. This is what you want in cache. And so what it turns out is, is that at one terabyte for VDI, say, we're seeing about 6% of the total capacity needs to be on flash to see all flash hits. Okay. Yeah. Thank but what's you. interesting about this is that while it doesn't stay constant and it doesn't grow linearly, it actually, there's a nonlinear growth curve such that when you get up to 10 terabytes, it's actually less than 3%. And to some degree, this makes, makes intuitive sense because you know that, that applications just in the course of what they do generate cold data. And so some of that stuff is just never going to get touched, but you keep it because you're supposed to or because you don't care to delete it, and it just sits there. This is, this is a read cache, it's not a read write cache, or it's, do, you, do you cache writes yes. in SSDs today? Yes. We, we want the opportunity to get a cache hit on first read, and so we do cache on write by default. There's policies you can set and change. Go ahead, Dan. Talk at Lucas' throat. <laughs> <laughs> it may be worth just pointing out, you know, because we've talked about this in past times. We've, because of the log structuring we do in our file system, effectively on writes, we're serializing random writes. So you can think of what our file system is doing is taking a thousand random writes and turning them into kind of one full stripe sequential write. So in effect, yeah, a dozen slow spindles from a write perspective behave as, a, as if they're almost getting SSD performance. Yeah. So our whole write path is optimized to be fast for disk. Yeah. And so what Larry's talking about here is what's needed where we use the SSD is as a read cache so that we're accelerating those reads. And this is where this analysis of working set is instrumental in how do you size that and how do you think about approaching that. So you I mentioned just make sure after clear. compression, what does that mean? So the, the one terabyte of raw data that's compressed yeah, so then gets to be a 60 gigabit yeah, so this gigabyte working when, set. When we're seeing this, it's you know probably, one terabyte of compressed data. Yeah, exactly. It's probably you know one and a half to three terabytes, Two terabytes something, something like, like that. that of user visible data. Oh, so so this six percent isn't. It's a compression artifact. It's part right. of. It's not a compression because right, yeah, the, the raw data is compressed too. Right, because it's, yeah, yeah, it's all compressed. It's compressed. Everything yeah. here is compressed. Apple to apple. So um, this is really cool because it kind of points out, at least uh, it's a validation to us of our, one of our core sort of um, you know, approaches, um, which is focus on keeping. And, and the great thing is, yeah, you know, as, we, as we go to support larger and larger applications, um, you know, this, this approach of making sure you're smart about what you keep in Flash um, actually starts to pay off even more. So, Larry, just to make yeah, sure, so, that's, so it also that's data means, coming in from your info site, right? That's right. This is real data that you're coming in yeah, yeah. saying this is that's what we across see. across the whole, the okay. whole field. So you're logging the trace activity, IO traces and info site? Well, so some of this is based on estimates. Now, we do have some traces. There's different contexts in which those are collected. Um, we could talk about that another time, but it would take up half an hour to talk about it. But, but this also means that, that scaling out gives you a bigger performance boost because you're consolidating the workloads and need a lower percentage of flash to get the same performance boost. So four independent arrays, each of which had two and a half terabytes, would need more flash than one scale-out pool. I assume this is a pool. single array. Yeah, if, if you're distributing an instance now across multiple arrays through a pool, right. 
Yeah, exactly right. No, you, you hit the hit the nail on the head. It all yes. depends on whether it's one VDI. I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. One SQL database or, or multiple SQL databases that you're distributing across it, multiple arrays, right? Right. But but in the VDI case, there's the commonality is so great that. All right. Um. So now the InfoSight side, I'm just going to talk about it really quickly because most of you have seen some of this. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about this and why it's cool. So this uh, is our performance tab as it has existed. And it's cool because we have this model of the cache and we read the workload and we say, okay, we think you need about this much cache to get good performance. But what's interesting about that, that process is that it's completely independent of the latencies that we measure. We don't take latency into account. We take other things into account. Um, like, you know, compression and read-write ratios, and we look at the hit rate as a function of cache age and all kinds of other stuff. And then we come up with this model and we solve and we say, well, we should probably have about this much. Um, but then when you actually tile out latency underneath, what you'll see is you'll start to see just a little bit of red minutes sneaking in when you get up into the red up here, which is a completely independent validation of how we do it. Um, and so this has proven to be wildly successful we have, you know, people nowadays just, they, scale, they feel they're free to scale up. They have confidence in the system. Um, they, nobody's come back and said, you know, that's, that scale up you told me to do, I shouldn't have scaled up. So I'm really proud of that. That's been a huge accomplishment for us because we try to err on the conservative side if we have to. So we try not to tell people to spend money if we don't believe that they need to. So this has been a really uh, big victory for us this year. <clears throat> Capacity forecasting, you know, this is really cool and it seems so trivial and, and people have been trying to do it for so long and every management tool has one. But what, what's interesting about it is when you actually stop and rethink the process of how you do your forecasting and you say, well, you know, I, I want the recent history to count more than stuff out here. Or if someone deleted volumes out here, I don't want to count that in my forecast. And then I want some error bars on here, which are kind of hard to see in the slide here. Um, then, so I, because I want to know if, how sure I am that I'm, you know, that I'm going to end up there. And you actually step back and do it right, people trust it and they like it. And so, you know, we, we actually did this, I think, the right way. We stepped back and said, let's, let's, let's set up a model that does everything we want it to do. Let's cross validate it throughout the field, make sure it works, and put it out in front of people. And people have loved it. Proactive wellness, uh, you know, I just wanted to touch on this, but I think Rod's already done a really good job, you know. Part of our job is always going to be to make sure that uh, we put the benefits of what we know out in front of customers. You know, as, as you can see here, probably out of space soon, right? This is an urgent alert because we're forecasting that within a couple weeks you're going to run out of space. Seems pretty straightforward, right? And, and based on this, you can get emails or um, you can automate cases which will be open for you. We'll contact you, we'll reach out to you and, and, and work the case with you if that ever happens. So we've tried to take all the uncertainty and manularity out of the whole process. And I think we've done a really good job of that. So uh, at a high level, this is, this is how we do it. So we've got massive and complex data sets. Rod already talked about the sensors uh, that we have access to. It's fantastic stuff. We have some really great engineers that I work for. Uh, Mark Cook is uh, one of our data scientists. Um, he's uh, been been uh, around a number of industries, including storage, for a long time. David Adamson is uh, f fresh out of Berkeley, a uh, PhD program, and he's the one that's been diving in on those uh, working set estimations with, with myself and Mark, so it's been really fantastic. Finally, we've, uh, we have upgraded uh, our infrastructure to Vertica, so the new beta is now running on Vertica. We've got our uh, sensor data in there and config data and so on and we're operating out of Vertica now. So that's just been a real relief because we had, we had to have, I don't know because I don't keep stats on this, we had to have one of the largest uncharted Postgres instances in the world. I mean, it was massive. It was about, about a quarter petabyte uh, from a user perspective before compression. Um, and uh, I'm just, it's, you know, it's just been really getting sluggish and everyone wants to do more. And so it's really great, you know, now to be done with that transition. Oh, right, so I wanted to finish with this. So, uh, let's see how I, let's see. Oh, trackpad, let's see, this up. Yeah, 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 okay, here we go. So now this guy, this guy had a cache, a sizing issue, 
a couple of months ago. So I wanted to show what that looked like when we actually you know, went down and drilled in. And this is one of the new tools that we're putting out next week. All right, so what we're seeing here is about a two-week time period. Um, what we're seeing here is uh, latency. Now the blue is read and the, the black is write. Now you can see this is a little higher. This, this blue is a little higher than we would like. In fact, when you average the read and write latencies, you're over two milliseconds, and so the way I can tell that is because we start putting little colored things here when we have over two millisecond latency. So we want to figure out what's the issue there, you know, what's causing us trouble. So we scroll down here, and uh, what we've done is uh, we've done a factor analysis on the back end that looks at all kinds of correlates with latency. So the neat thing is, you know, you can have a model where you really try with every release to understand how every piece of latency is going to add up. But the problem is there's always a lot of unknowns still. If there aren't, you know, you have a, I, I don't know, maybe it's possible, but I've never seen it because there's so many interactions with the host and the network, um, not to mention, uh, the, you know, the queue depths and the locality of the data and things that are just different. They're just different from workload to workload and release to release, there will be something different. Is the latency different. measured at the subsystem level? So, so for, the, for us, this is, this is internal to the array. Um, uh, with one exception, if we can see retransmits happening, then we'll call that out here as a, okay. as a network uh, issue. So, uh, so here we have the, the factors that we break it out into. And uh, you can see that, that what's happening here is, uh, this is the, uh, we're saying, oh, you know, you could use a little more cache to bring down that, bring down that, uh, that random read latency, which correlates to our cache recommendation that we had given already. But this is the kind of thing, because what will happen sometimes is we're being conservative. So you'll look at the InfoSight sizing chart and it'll say, well, you know, you're, you're kind of where you need to be with cash. Don't, you don't need to go buy more. But if someone's really performance hungry, they want to go look and say, okay, what happened at 10 o'clock and how do I fix it? That's what this is for. So it gives you more flexibility as well as confirmation of what you're seeing up there. And it's a really neat uh, analysis that's gone into this. So, you know, we're using this feature of, of Vertica now where it's got uh, basically R built in. So you can run R functions against your data without having to pull the data out, you know, into, a, into another application. R so, functions? Is that a pirate thing? It's like SSRS except not. <laughs> <laughs> like SSPS, I'm going to use SPSS, that. SPSS, but not horribly expensive, right? Yeah. Exactly. SPSS, yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. Which blue bar? Oh, oh, by the way, yeah, they did their upgrade here. See? And then the latency went down. Yay, so it worked. Okay, what were, <laughs> were you looking for? A, a, another vendor who shall remain nameless we saw this morning um, showed us something similar to this with a what if. That how much would my latency change if I added another node to my cluster? My latency change if I added another node to my cluster. Ah, so right now what you've seen is scale up options. Up right, top. I've seen a scale out alternatives here. But the scale out is coming, like in the next month or two. Okay, in, including what if? Absolutely. No, there's no other way to do that. Because there's so many options, you can't just say, this is the only thing you could possibly do, scale up or scale out. Right. Add only one node. You can't say that to someone. So. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the challenge here with, with a scale-out environment, you're seeing you've got actually multiple arrays, each having their own cache configuration, each having their own disk configuration, right. and each having their own workload to some extent. And, and trying to aggregate that information across all the arrays for the cluster, it's going to be an interesting endeavor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, so I, I theoretically, it should all just kind of. Like the random <laughs> distribution of things should just kind of make yeah. it easy. But we'll, I mean, it'll, it's always going to be a challenge. We'll see how much homogeneity there is. And, and I would assume that within a pool, the arrays would be similarly configured most of the time. That's right. That's that what the if, I'm, if, I'm, yeah. if I have three nodes and I need more capacity and I decide I'm gonna add, I would add one shelf to each, not three shelves to the first one. Yeah. That's right. But I also so, remember seeing the screenshot where it showed, I mean, yeah, this is scale out if you need another node or not necessarily in there, but I remember seeing you should go to a different sized array for this particular array or 
upgrade your cash size or whatever. Oh, right. You do recommend how to go up. So right now, what right. you're seeing Because unlike up top the other guys, these up. guys have four dimensions of scale, yes, no, and yeah. exactly. just have one. So there's just exactly. one kind of the yeah, lateral it's easier for them. Yeah. yeah. Right. What we recommend is that the user scale up before they scale out. Ah. So scale up is, is simpler, it's more economical. And when they reach the limits of scale up, you know, as I was talking about earlier, there are short limits to what scale up can do. Then they scale out. Right, so, but, but scale up is still more about capacity than performance. No, scale up does both can scale capacity, but you can also add more flash drives, for example. Right. You can upgrade you can your controllers. Yeah. So, till you till you run out of because you can, you can, till uh, you run out of CPU. You're talking cycles. about that model number, right? Because yeah, you can just pull out the controller, the passive, and upgrade it to like a 400 or yeah, 600 right. series. Right. So in this the day. Yeah. So in this case, and, well, and I have you, to be you honest, could, but some of us aren't that brave. You would do that. <laughs> well, let's just put it this way: it's not supposed to cause a problem. You might do it on a Sunday, but it's right. not a problem. <laughs> <operation. laughs> right, right, right. At like midnight, I'm, like, or I'm going like that. from a 3270 to a 6080. Okay. See, I'm, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm brave enough that I might do it at eight o'clock at night on a Friday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that I have the weekend in case something goes wrong, and yeah. but there's I wouldn't, always that support asterisk. There. But I wouldn't <laughs> cancel the kid's birthday party on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, I think you were talking about this model name here, right? So now what we're going to have to do is blow this up and give options, and and so that's that's what we're going to do. Okay, so that was it. Thanks, guys. Do you have any other questions? I mean, it seems like we're just having a conversation, which is awesome. I, I mean, just to point out, I'm not sure if everybody understands, but what that's telling them is literally here's what you should buy next. It's this is the model, or this is the exact cash upgrade. So it's very specific, and then to this point, you know, scale out means there may be a couple of different directions that you can go. Okay, but where's the buy now button? <laughs> I want prime shipping on Amazon. Where's, where's, where's the big sales? That he wants that. That thought has crossed our mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it has. I imagine the sales and PO part's the easy part. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, you know, I think Rod mentioned this, but you know, the amount of because we have customers, you know, customers from three years ago that have since come back and now they've got, you know, 100 database instances. They started with 10. Well, guess what? Their combined working set got to the point where things started to bog down. We can come in and say very simply, you need to double or you need to quadruple. And right. by showing them all that data and the evidence, here's what's going on in your workload. Here's exactly what impact it has. It's some of the easiest upgrade for us, but importantly, it gives the customer what they need at the lowest cost and lets them continue to grow their organization. Oh, oh so and, it's a big and, it, and it also is a huge ad, 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 address to the customer being pissed off because the thing you sold them is now too slow. Where, you know, it's not just that piece of junk that you sold me three years ago. It's, it's the, you yeah. can go, here, we'd be glad to fix this. All you need is this. Yeah. Yeah, well, of course. So somebody wanted to ask, how many, how, what's the percentage of customers actually upgrade the arrays in the middle of the day? This is the Chris, uh, you have that number? <laughs> so, what's the answer, I don't know. Yeah, so we, we've measured that over the last several GA releases, and it's actually pretty constant, like <laughs> remarkably constant. And it's about 61% of the arrays are upgraded during that customer's time zone Business hour, Monday through Friday. Wow. There's a lot of ballsy how, folks how out there. The <laughs> Again? How fast after the release of the software? Well, so to give you an answer on that one, we just released 148 uh, the other night. We haven't told anybody yet. We always do a slow roll. So we put it out so that in a manner that it's visible. Uh, because it's a GA stream, the 148 maintenance release is GA out the gate because of all the QA we've done and everything. So there's a confidence level there. But we still slow roll everything because we don't want, you know, whatever, 3,000 arrays upgrading the same night. Um, so we put it out there, and then the day or so after, we'll send out the, the notice, to, well, we'll send the notice to the SEs and, and to a handful of customers, and we'll just ramp that up sort of exponentially as, as things go and we get some field experience. So we haven't told anybody yet about 148. There's 61 customer, 62 or something like that, uh, customer systems running that release already, and we haven't told anybody. <laughs> so I don't know how they find out. There was only about three customers that, that we wanted to deploy it to right away just for, for uh, fixes that they wanted. Um, but other than that, there's uh, you know, what's the percentage 60 something of your base running the, the prior version of code? Is that, Say again? What, what percentage of your base is running the prior version of code? Yeah, so 147 is our current GA release. Part of this, yeah. And there's about, I think it's actually about 58% or more. 
Not bad. Seventy percent, maybe running that release on the out? one four stream. It's about ninety percent or ninety two percent of the systems running the. How long has one four seven been out? It came out in uh, I have to remember uh, August. It's not bad. Yeah. So you said sixty one percent of uh, the people the upgraded during the during Their production. Product. Yeah. Or are those successful upgrades? Were they all successful? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think the clarifying. 61 would stay constant if they were. <laughs> all right. So as you, as you scale up and you get to that maximum capacity, right, so you get to the latest and greatest version, do you have to buy, it to scale out, do you have to buy the, uh, uh, an equal array or can you start low on the other side? Yeah, you don't have to buy the same configuration. You can start out small. You can okay. So they don't across the board. They don't have to be the same they array. Have to. Okay. Okay. So if I if I had one array, yeah, and I scaled it up to four shelves. Yes. How difficult is the transition to two arrays each with two shelves? I, so we do not support that today, which will essentially require removing shelves. Yeah. <laughs> but what you can do is Cause, add. Yeah, because I'd like to array. rebalance, and I don't necessarily need eight shelves right now. That is right. Okay. Uh, and that's on our radar. Fine. <laughs> if you have spares, I'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> Not every vendor, seriously, man. No, that was the Howard. <laughs> he actually gets it. The difference. You got two percent, You ready? So, um, no, great conversation. I just wanted to say good, um, good digging in on the capabilities. Hopefully that gave everyone good perspective of kind of the very cool stuff that we've been up to back here these days. I mean, we're really, you know, as I look at what's happening within Flash, things like scale out become, I think, one of the things that really separates the haves and the have-nots going forward. At a, you know, we're in an era today where the number of spindles doesn't dictate performance anymore. By design, storage is moving where the bottleneck increasingly becomes a CPU bottleneck or maybe an amount of flash in the case of that. And so, you know, from our perspective, what we built here is a foundation. We talked today about, yes, there are particular limitations in the first release that we've taken. But I think importantly, you know, the foundation that we built is something that we can grow on and really take this to a much broader set of use cases and applications and, and the like. And it's, it's a foundation we really think we can build on for many years to come. And we're really excited about what we can go do. Unless there are any questions, any other comments or thoughts from anybody else out there? Great discussion. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone here, we hope, sometime next year. Thank you very much.